So welcome to the second video um, in our th three video series of um, lectures, video lectures. And today we're going to talk about the um, underlying rationale behind the quantitative genetic statistical approaches in which we'll apply linear algebra. So we're going to keep things simple here and not talk about these approaches from a linear algebra perspective, but instead we're going to take a more holistic 40,000 foot view, big picture of what these analyses are, why they're important, and then um, simple statistical models showing how these work. So first thing I'm going to talk about is genome-wide association study, or GWAS. And the biological objective of GWAS is to identify genomic regions associated with the phenotype. So, um, at each SNP in, in the genome, at each marker in the genome, we're going to fit a statistical model. Okay? And then at each of the statistical models, we're going to perform a hypothesis test where our null hypothesis is that there's no association with our SNP and our phenotype. So, in this picture, our x-axis is our genomic position along um, chromosome 5 of mace, and then our y-axis is our negative log base 10 p-value. So basically, the taller this y-axis is, the stronger evidence there is against this null hypothesis, the stronger the evidence there is that there is association between your SNP and your phenotype. So along chromosome 5, we are testing for association between each marker and our phenotype of interest, which is vitamin E levels in maize green. Right over here, we see the tallest, you know, the tallest Y coordinate, the tallest line. This is our SNP with the strongest association with vitamin E levels, and great, it makes biological sense because this peak SNP is within a gene that, well, makes sense for um, regulating vitamin E levels in maize grain. The next um, topic we're going to talk about are quantitative genetics analysis in which we apply um, statistical approaches is genomic selection. So what we do is we start off with a training population that is both genotyped um, with a genome-wide set of SNPs or markers and phenotyped with a trait of interest. We're going to use these data to train a genomic selection model. Briefly, our Y variable is our trait of interest, our phenotype of interest, and then all of the X and then all of the SNPs throughout the genome constitute our X variables. So we fit this model to our data in our training population, and then we go to some breeding material that has been genotyped with the same genome-wide set of markers, and we essentially plug in those genotypes into this fitted genomic selection model. And then we use this genomic selection model to obtain genomic estimated breeding values. And essentially, you can think of this as, um, you know, predicted trait values if we want to oversimplify a little bit. And based off of these predicted trait values, we'll then make selections. So you can imagine that you can use genomic selection to select predicted optimal phenotype of uh, optimal individuals with optimal predicted phenotypes using these predicted statistical models instead of having to wait um, you know one or more uh, field seasons to obtain your uh, actual observed phenotype values. So because of this genomic selection is a very powerful tool because it can speed up the breeding cycle and make more agronomically optimal crops um, or, you know, animals, um, you know, larger animals, um, you know, put into the forefront more um, quickly. Okay, so the basic building block of GWAS and genomic selection in terms of statistical models, uh, the basic building block is a simple linear regression. That is, statistical models used for GWAS and genomic selection are um, you know, fancier versions of this model. So you can imagine we have a quantitative x variable, a quantitative y variable. So simple linear regression is going to model this linear relationship. 
So our y variable is over here on the left-hand side of the equation, and our x variable is on the right-hand side of the equation, and we have an intercept parameter and a slope parameter, and we have a random error term. So our parameters, beta naught and beta 1, are unknown constants that are you know, measured in, in an immeasurable population. And then our data sets of n observations of x and y, that is you have n observational units where x and y are measured, these data sets are used to estimate these parameters. So now we're going to talk about um, a slight variation of simple and linear regression and how it can help us address a uh, biological issue or a practical issue. So let's suppose that we go to um, a CG center or a um, international research center that has germplasm that has a whole bunch of seeds from a particular crop of interest. And we go ahead and put these seeds into a diversity panel, into a data set, um, and we grow them out in multiple environments. So therefore, we will have multiple trait values measured for the same genotypically unique seed, um, you know, individual, across multiple environments. And so what we need to do in order to do GWAS or genomic selection is we need to have one phenotypic measurement per genotypically unique individual, even though they're measured across multiple environments. So, how can we do this? How can we summarize this trait information? Well, we can tweak the simple linear regression model to account for genetic environment and so-called GYE sources. And then the resulting output is a blup or a blue for, of trait values for each genotypically unique taxon. And for the sake of this introductory um, lecture, we're going to say that blups and blues are fancy schmancy averages, although they are really a little more complicated. Um, so first, the statistical model used to obtain best linear bias predictions, blups. So our y variables are phenotype, and then we have a random genotype effect, a random environmental effect, and a random genotype by environmental effect. So some of you might be wondering, what do I mean by random? Well, to keep things simple, what I mean is this. Our genotypes, our environments, our G by E effects in our data set, we are assuming are randomly drawn from an entire population of genotypes and environments. And therefore, the inferences we make are going to be for those you know, entire populations of genotypes, environments, and G by E effects. Um, without further ado, or, um, we also have our grand mean and a random error term. So we fit this model to our data, and the first thing we get is a blup of the genotype effect. And so remember, this blup is a fancy version of an average, so we have one trait value for each genotype, for each taxa. Um, and then this blup will go into our GWAS and genomic selection model. Another thing that we can get from this is um, estimates of our variation in our trait attributable to genotype, variation attributable to environment, and you know, variation attributable to the interaction between genotype and environment. And this latter variance component estimate information is going to be useful for calculating heritabilities, which is basically measuring the um, the proportion of total trait variation attributable to genetic effects. So, very similar to the model used to obtain blups, we have here the model used to obtain best linear bias estimators. So, it's very similar again, but let's just go through it. Our y variables are phenotype, and instead of having genotype as a random effect, as we did on the previous slide, we're now having genotype as a fixed effect. And then the remaining environment and G by E terms are also random. Why? Because that is what's typically done in this field. Um, and then we have grand mean and a random error term. So let's focus for a second on our fixed genotype effect. 
The statistical interpretation of a fixed effect is that your inference space is that you only care about the particular genotypes in your model or in, in your data set. So if you care only about making inferences on the exact genotypes that you have in your data set, then blues are for you. So what you get from this is your best linear bias estimators of your genotype effects, which you can carry forth into GWAS or genomic selection. So as a segue to the statistical model used for genome-wide association studies, let's talk about an inherent issue that we need to account for in data sets used to um, conduct a GWAS. So what we're looking at here is a diversity panel of just over 2,800 maize inbreds. Okay, so what we did here was a print, or what was done in this paper was that a principal coordinate analysis was taken. So basically, all of the genetic markers measured among these 2,800 indi 15 individuals were, um, you know, put forth through a statistical analysis called principal coordinate, and it helped us identify patterns of markers where the alleles tend to segregate. Um, in, in particular patterns. And so what we see here is that if we look at the two most important um, patterns of segregation in the markers, we're seeing that essentially the markers are doing a really good job of clustering um, the individuals, these maize inbreds, into their, um, their subpopulation. So for example, all the subtropical maize lines are over here, all the sweet corn lines are here. So. Um, this is an example of population structure, um, and if we do not account for, for population structure in our statistical model, we might be able to identify a statistically significant association between the marker and trait, but the significant association will just be um, accounting for population structure instead of actual genes that are underlying the phenotypic variability of our trait. Similarly related to um, population structure is familial relatedness. So um, if familial relatedness is not accounted for, then you know you would have an advantage of, you know, if there's an individual with no genotypic information available, you would just go to their most closely related relative and, and use the genotypic information there. And we don't want to do that. In order to um, reduce familial relatedness due to familial, in order to reduce false positives attributable to familial relatedness, we want to have all the individuals on the level playing field, um, and so we need to take familial relatedness into account, and this is how we do it. So this is the unified mix on your model. Um, our y variables are phenotype of interest, and then at each of our markers we're testing throughout the genome, we're going to fit one of these models. And the marker genotypes are included as an X variable. And here's your slope, your additive marker effect estimate. Um, so we include um, additional X variables to account for subpopulation structure, and these are fixed effects. And then we include our genotypes, our taxas, as random effects to account for familiar relatedness. And then we have a genomic estimated kinship matrix to essentially measure the degree of relatedness between our individuals. And then, of course, we have our grand mean and our random error term. So the basic genomic selection model looks very similar to the GWAS model. Um, the X variables just differ slightly. So our trait is our Y variable of interest, and then all of our markers, all P of them throughout the entire genome, are explanatory variables in our model. And they'll have a separate slope um, you know, parameter um, for each of the P different markers. Now, a bell and whistle of a typical modern data set is that you'll have much more markers than you will have individuals. So you can imagine we might have hundreds of thousands or potentially millions of markers, why only maximum maybe like 2,000 or 5,000 individuals. So this causes some problems when your number of markers exceeds your number of individuals. Um, to put it bluntly, the problem is that unique 
estimates and marker effects do not exist. So one solution is to add a penalty to your um, likelihood function or your uh, model selection process that restricts the values that your marker effects can take on. Another solution is to you know, take a Bayesian perspective where you say your parameters, your beta 1 through beta p that I showed a couple slides ago, they are a random variable that follows a prior distribution. So here's um, a description of the ridge regression best linear unbiased prediction or RR bluff model for genomic selection. Arguably, this is the most widely used model in genomic selection. Um, and so what we have is that our y variables are phenotype of interest, and then each of our markers are included as random effects. And then we have our error term and our intercept. And the blups, the predictions of these random marker effects, are subject to this ridge regression penalty there. OK, so a pro of RR Blup is that it's easy to use. It has been implemented in user-friendly software, such as what I'm going to look at in the next video series. And it yields de decent prediction accuracies. A con, a disadvantage, is that um, whether or not your marker is tagging a large effect or a small effect gene, your ridge regression penalty is given the same amount of restriction. So perhaps for some very specific you know, traits that have extremely large effect genes, um, you know, RR blood may not be optimal for that. Okay, so now I'm going to conclude on assumptions of our error terms. So in all of the models we've shown, we've seen that we had an error term. So we assume that the error terms in our data follow a normal independent distribution with population mean zero and this population variance. Okay? So that is, our assumptions are normality, independence, and equal variance among our error terms. And so when you get a data set, I strongly recommend that if you're going to use GWAS or genomic selection or fit these models for blups or blues, you check these assumptions. And if these assumptions are violated, you can transform the traits. So for example, you can take square root plant height. There's this really handy procedure called the Boxcox procedure, which um, will do a grid search and use optimality criterion to select an optimal transformation of your trait. Or you can do a bootstrapping procedure, which basically, um, in effect, liberates your test statistic from having to follow some named distribution of the null hypothesis and you let your data itself drive your um, you know your significance threshold thank you for your time bye bye